Psalm 119, and we'll be picking up this evening in verse 57. And then going through this kind of stanza by stanza, each one of these represented by a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And we come to the het this evening, verse 57. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on your ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we delight that you are our portion. And so, God, we pray that as we look to your word and as we confess this with the psalmist this evening, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would draw us closer to you, and God perhaps would even work to draw us closer to each other. We pray for our students who are even now probably involved in uh, a time of Bible study together and in your word. And I just pray that you would continue to work through that, that your word would not return void, but would accomplish all that you've sent it forth to accomplish. Uh, and that would be for the stirring up of faith in these young men and women and the strengthening of faith and a, and a greater desire to know you and to love you. And God, we pray for John Riva, who are, <laughs> who are, are, are waiting it out at the hospital and have been for quite a while. And we just pray that you would continue to work to give them the strength uh, to press on, to continue in this process of labor for Reva in particular as she is uh, dealing with all the physical toil that comes with this and in addition to all of just the emotional uh, and, and other worries and concerns, I pray that she would know your presence, uh, that you would be very near in ways that are so abundant and evident and that they would be sustained just by your kindness during this time. And God, we, we look forward to rejoicing with them when this young one is here and, and being able to surround them as a community as they continue to seek to raise up their children, to know you and to love you, uh, to fear you. And I just pray that you would do mighty, wonderful things, that you would bring a, a quick and safe delivery and that you would, uh, would bring health and God, that they would be able just to celebrate the good gift um, once all of this waiting is over. Thank you for this time together. God, I pray you're glorified in it. In Christ's name, amen. Well, last week we looked at verses 49 through 56, and we talked about God's good word for suffering saints. You, you read through that passage, and we pointed some of this out last week. You see all the different ways that this psalmist is, is, is really just pointing out the ways that they are suffering. They're under great affliction, and we saw many of the ways that that is unfolding in their life. But we saw in the midst of all that difficulty what God's word does for us in those difficult days. God's word gives us hope in this life and for the life to come. God's word gives us comfort even when the world stands against us. God's word gives us zeal for God's glory and a longing for God's presence. And God's word gives us blessing as we strive to obey it. And so we, we saw how God gives hope in, in these difficult days, in these times of suffering. And as we come to the next stanza of this song, we really are kind of continuing on that theme, but we're kind of taking it to the next step, to the next level. In, in, in the, the verses that we looked at last week, the psalmist really, you get this sense that he is running to God for refuge. Uh, he, he, he's overwhelmed in his afflictions, burdened by the things of this life, but he's clinging to God's promises, almost in some sort of desperation and in pleading with God to remember his word to his servant, those sorts of things. But in the verses that we just read uh, that we're looking at tonight, things really take on a bit of a different tone. Um, we find here that the psalmist comes across much more fully assured. Uh, he's resting firmly in God's promises. Uh, he's Finding his hope, he's confident in the Lord's mercies. We find a believer here who's living out his faith and trusting the Lord and doing his will, and he's, he's blessed greatly in the midst of that. 
So if you, you come to that conclusion that the blessing has fallen on me, he says in verse 56, that I've kept your precepts, we're seeing that blessing unfolding in his life in that he really is beginning to approach these difficulties and these struggles with a very different sort of perspective. Now we know that apart from a work of God's Spirit, we have no hope of salvation. It's God who works through his Holy Spirit to change us, to bring about regeneration, to wake us from our slumber, to open blind eyes and deaf ears, to enlighten our minds. Uh, he gives life where there was only death before. But we know from what we read in the scripture that, that the Spirit of God is really working uh, alongside the knowledge of God's word to bring these things to pass. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 3, it tells us this, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So we find that in Romans chapter 10. It's by a work of God's spirit, the truth of God's word is then applied to our hearts. And that saves us, and that sanctifies us, and that sustains us. Now why make that point in light of the passage we're looking at this evening? Well, we've seen the psalmist in that previous passage there running to God for refuge in the midst of his sufferings. And it seems like there is that element even of desperation as he's coming and pleading with God to remember him. He's, he's got wicked men around him who are deriding him, mocking him, belittling him. But, but so he's, he's looking to God. He, he's realizing that he's a stranger in a foreign land. And so he's crying out to God in the night in those sleepless nights. We have all of that going on. But here in this next stanza, picking up in verse 57... We, we really get a picture of the psalmist as having really embraced this life as one of God's chosen children, devoting his life to grateful service in response to that. And so no longer do we seem to find this man who's somewhat overwhelmed by his afflictions, but a man who's overjoyed by what he knows to be true from God's word. So I want us to think this evening on the life of someone who has been saved, who has been sanctified, who is being sustained moment by moment by God through the truth of his word. When we're able to take hold of these things, as Colossians chapter 2 says, to, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which, by the way, he says is Christ. But when you can mine the depths of God's word and you, you pull from that God's plan of redemption and the promises he has for his children, when you begin to really grasp those things and take hold of those things and you are resting in all of God's promises, when the blessing has fallen to you, as we saw last week, to be able to keep those precepts, when you're living that way, I want to talk about the life of the one whose life has been transformed by God's word. I'm going to give you eight points tonight, and some of y'all say, oh no, but that's okay. We're just going to draw from each verse a, a different kind of uh, primary thought there. These are going to be short and sweet, but we're going to work through these verses one by one, eight points for you about the one who has been transformed by the word of God. What do we find in these verses? What are the things that define, that, 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 that kind of identify the life of the one who has been transformed by the word of God. So we'll start in verse 57. The one who has been transformed by the word of God treasures the God of the word. So the one who's been transformed by the word of God treasures the God of the word. Look there at verse 57. He says, the Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. Now, if you look there at that word, Lord, you'll see it's written probably in your text in all capital letters. Maybe if you have certain translations, they may even translate it as Yahweh or as Jehovah. But Jehovah, we see here, is my portion. That word for portion would refer to a share, to an inheritance, to a possession. And there's actually an indication in the way that word is used of a chosen portion or share or inheritance or possession. Now, I think we need to be careful because we know that it is God who has chosen us, who has appointed us to eternal life, who has sent his spirit, who has raised us up and drawn us into fellowship with him. It's God's mercy that transforms us. It's God's mercy that has taken hold of the one who writes this psalm. But 
even if Scripture says that we love because he loved us first, we know that God's love toward us awakens for us in us a love for him. It, it awakens in us a desire to, to know him and to have him and to be ever nearer to him. And what we find here is that this psalmist is saying, look, the thing that I desire above all else, the thing that I treasure above all else is this. The Lord, Jehovah, is my portion. Now, if we think about this, you know, and likely who, who's writing this psalm, there are different ideas about this. We're not given clear identification, but there's good reason to believe there's some strong uh, uh, um, teachings out there that would point us toward David writing this. If that's the case, you see, this is a really big deal. You're talking about the king of Israel who has anything and everything he could possibly ever desire in this world. Whoever this person is, whatever, they, whatever it is, though, they say, whatever this world has for me, it doesn't matter in light of who God is and the things that he has done. He is choosing to make God his portion. Now, again, put that in our understanding of the gospel. We get this, that God comes to us. We love because he loved us first. But when he does that, there is a love that begins to, 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 to be formed in us, that blossoms and that grows to the point where what we desire above all else is this, to know this God who has saved us. And so he says, the Lord is my portion. Well, how do we know that God is our portion? Well, he says, the Lord is my portion. And in light of that, what's he going to do? He says, I promise to keep your word with God as his portion, the psalmist here desires to serve the Lord above all things, above any other portion that he might have in this world. You know, Scripture's clear that we, we can only serve one master, right? And so we can chase after the things of this world, or we can invest our lives in knowing God and, and being in relationship with God. And the psalmist here has chosen that the Lord will be his portion. And so above all, he wants to know the Lord, and he promises then as a result of that, to keep the Lord's word. So the one who is transformed by the word of God treasures the God of the word. See, that was short and sweet. I told you. We can do that eight times over, can't we? The one transformed by the word of God treasures the God of the word. And then we see in that next verse that the one who is transformed by the word of God seeks the favor of God. Verse 58, I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. He says, I entreat your favor with all of my heart. The psalmist here, because the Lord is his portion and he desires to, to keep his word, he, he goes to the Lord and he's moved to go to God in prayer and to plead with the Lord to show him his favor. As he desires to walk in the way of the word of God, he knows he can't do this on his own, so he's pleading for the Lord to give him strength. He looks for the favor of God. Now that word for entreating, if you unpack that word, what you'll find is it implies someone who is weak. It's a word that's used to describe the one who is sick, who is broken down. And I think when you take that into consideration and, and, and you think about that in the context of someone who's praying, who's seeking the Lord, who's entreating God to show them favor, does that not speak to who we are? We recognize if the Lord is our portion and we are striving to keep his word and making those commitments, one of the things we're going to recognize is that apart from the Lord's favor, we don't have a whole lot to get excited about. We recognize our position before God as weak and wounded, as sick and sore, as those sinners who are poor and needy, but we come to the Lord and what do we find when we seek the Lord he will be found. And those who seek God's favor earnestly while setting him as their portion and committing to keeping his word, they will find that favor. The psalmist knew that he was dependent upon Jehovah. He needed strength. He needed healing. He needed hope, and he needed it every moment. And so as he seeks out the Lord who is his portion, he pleads for his favor with all of his heart. He says, there be gracious to me according to your promise. The psalmist has God as his portion, but he wants more. He wants more than anything else to know God as his portion and to know him every moment as his portion. So he prays, and he pleads with the Lord to give him 
favor, to look on him, to be open to him, to be near to him. This, the same word comes up, perhaps you remember the blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. God tells Moses to go and say to the people, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, to be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. That idea of the Lord shining on you and and for his countenance to be upon, upon you. That's the same word that's being used here when he's seeking God's favor. And of course, he says, may the Lord be gracious to you, which is, again is what the psalmist is praying for here. So he desires this kind of mercy from God. He wants God's favor. He wants God's graciousness to be poured out upon him. And so he seeks his favor with all of his heart. For those of us who have been redeemed, I think we've seen this pattern to be true, at least at certain points in our lives. The more that we know of God, the more that we desire God. The more that we are are growing with him, the more we want to grow. So we, as people who can say the Lord is our portion, what do we do? We entreat his favor. We look for his gracious mercy to be poured on our life, and so we plead with the Lord to give us more, to receive all the good gifts that he's promised in his word for those who know him. He is our great treasure. He is the one that we desire. So those who have been transformed by God's word, they treasure the God of the word, and they seek the favor of the Lord. Next we see in verse 59 that the one who is The one who knows God through his word, the one who is transformed by the power of the word of God, they keep watch over their own life. Verse 59, he says, when I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. Here the psalmist is engaged in self-reflection. He's watching his own life. He's examining self, keeping watch over his own soul. He's looking to his ways. And he's looking to his ways, it becomes clear, with the goal of making sure that his ways are in keeping with God's ways. He says, when I think on my ways, that word for think, it refers to giving consideration to something, but it also refers to taking an account, to to a reckoning of sorts. He's looking at his life in light of God, in light of God's word, and there's a reckoning that's taking place here. He looks at himself to see how does he measure up to what God has called on him to do. So he's examining himself very carefully. He's thinking on his ways, his way of life, his path, or the journey that he's on, the language that's used there, his moral character. He's assessing himself with the goal that he can be conformed to what God desires for him in his word. And how do we know that's what he wants? How do we know that he is looking at his life so that he can conform his life to God? Because how does he respond to this? He says, I'm I'm looking here, I'm thinking on my ways, and then what do I do? I turn my feet to your testimonies. He points his life in the right direction. Whatever he sees where he's out of step with God's ways, he's redirecting his feet so that he's on the right path. Now, We live in our day with our GPS, and we've got roads that take us everywhere we want to go. Put yourself out somewhere where you don't have all of that, and you know that even the smallest deviation can end up leading you, the further you go down the path, way out of line. So this is someone who's taking an assessment of their life every moment, seeing how they measure up to the testimonies of God's word, and wherever they find themselves lacking, They're going to redirect their own path, and they're going to put themselves back in this place where they're obeying God's word and doing what he says. Where does the psalmist turn his feet? In whatever direction it is that God is pointing. So the one who has been transformed by the word of God keeps watch over their own life. We see that the one who has been transformed by the word of God is quick to obey the word of God. Verse 60, what does it say? I hasten. I do not delay to keep your commandments. He says, I hasten to keep your commandments. That word for hasten, it means to hurry. We know that much. But implicit in that is is this excitement, anticipation, this, this underlining joy. Now, sometimes we get in a hurry because we have no choice but to be in a hurry, and it's drudgery. 
But that's not what this word really indicates. When he says, I hasten here to keep your commands, it's with joy. It's with excitement. You think of trying to to, to get to a destination and you know that when you get there, everything is going to be good and wonderful. And so you have that excitement that builds within you. You got things in your life that you get excited about and you're just longing. You're, 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 You're ready to get there as soon as you can. That's the idea here. He's, he's directing his feet. He's turning his feet so that he can follow the Lord's testimonies. And he's excited to do it. And he doesn't waste his time. He does not delay. He is quick to put himself in the path of the Lord's commandments. He desires to obey God's word and to do it quickly because he knows that when he does that, it's going to be nothing but good for him. It's going to be God's glory. And so he counts God's word as precious. And he desires to put them into practice. So the one who has been transformed by the word of God is quick to obey the word of God. The one who is transformed by the word of God stands firm under persecution. Look at verse 61. He says, the cords of the wicked ensnare me. I do not forget your law. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. Now, if we go up to verse 51, you see there the insolent, he says, utterly deride me. He talks about the the, the wicked who are all around him in verse, uh, that's in verse 53. Indignation seizes him because of the wicked who forsake his law. But but you get the idea of these people who are then surrounding him to to mock and to belittle. And, And we see here that now they've kind of taken it to the next step. These, these cords, this, it's a rope, it's a snare, it's a trap that's meant to inflict pain or to bring about destruction. He says, they ensnare me, they surround me. That word can be used in terms of bearing false witness against me. So they are surrounding me to do me harm. This is what the wicked do to the one who stands firmly on the word of God. I think about the Pilgrim's Progress, if you've read that book. When, when, when they enter into Vanity Fair and they find all these things going on around them and they're not going to join in, they're not going to participate in all of the, the ungodliness and the worldliness around them. And so it begins with inquisitiveness, but soon it turns to anger, right? And they take them and they imprison them. And his friend, I'm trying to remember which one it is, is it hopeful at that point, is, is eventually put to death, right? So there's this, this, this murder that takes place over obedience to God's word. This is the idea. These wicked who surround me, when I won't join in, first they begin to mock and they begin to jeer. We saw that last week. Well, now they're working to ensnare me. They're putting me in a trap. They're trying to, to capture me so that they can destroy me. This is what's happening around him. But he says, look, that's not going to be something that's going to pull me off the path. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to keep going. He's not turned away. He does not forget God's law. We need to remember, when we are placed under persecution, when the world speaks ill against us, when we are mocked because of our faith, where are we going to find our strength? It's only going to work if we are drawing deeply from the well. If we know God through his word and we can stand upon his promises. I think of Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. What did he do? The devil came to him and offered him these temptations. And every time, what did he do? He responded with the word of God. He knew God's word. He wanted to obey God's word. He was going to be obedient to his father. And so he responded by putting his hope in the promises of God. And there were many throughout the ages. You, you read of some in the scriptures and some throughout history who, when it comes to this point where there are people who stand against them, who may begin by deriding them, mocking, jeering, and eventually will try to ensnare them and capture them and threaten their very lives, where do they find their hope? Where do they find their strength? Well, my conscience is bound to the word of God, so here I stand, I can do no other. The one who has been transformed by the word of God stands firm under persecution. We see that the one who has been transformed by the word of God rejoices in God's justice. Look at verse 62. He says, At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. Now think about this. Those of you who were here last week, let's think about some of this in context of what we see in the previous section there. Verse 55 tells us that the psalmist had sleepless nights. 
his trials, his sufferings, they disturbed him in his sleep. But when he, woke, when he woke up, he remembered God's name and he was committed to keeping God's law. Verse 54 talks about how he sang, uh, he sang songs. He, 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 his statutes, God's statutes had become his songs as he saw himself as a sojourner during those lonely times when here he is living in isolation, seeming to be the only one who's walking faith with the Lord, surrounded by these people who mock and jeer who are acting wickedly all around him, he finds his hope and he sings these songs as a sojourner while he longs for home. Verse 52 says that God's rules gave him comfort. If you were here for that, a lot of those same principles become, begin to come into play here. But in this case, it doesn't seem that the psalmist rises up in despair, but he rises up with joy. It's his delight to sing these songs of praise to God in the night. And why? Because he knows that God is a righteous ruler. His ways are just. Now, we talked about that. It says there, I, I praise you because of your righteous rules. We talked about this when we were looking at verse 52 last week. Remember, verse 51, the insolent, they deride me, uh, but I don't turn away from your law. And he's taking comfort in the fact that God is a just rule. He says, when I think about your rules, and we talked about how that could be applied as we see being used in this psalm to just in general to the principles laid out in God's word. But that word speaks of God's judgments, the ways that he has executed his righteousness, he has carried out his righteous will on the earth. And so he says, even in the midst of this, when wicked people are trying to ensnare him, when he rises up in the night, he praises God because he knows that God has all of these things under control, and that sooner or later, God is going to deal with his enemies. God will bring about justice. He will deal with the wicked, and he will deliver his faithful. The psalmist we talked about last week was remembering the ways that God had done that in the past. He had seen God deal with his enemies and vindicate his people, and he knows that God's going to do that now. So he's praising God and rejoicing in his righteous rules. Every word of God is true. Every promise of God will come to pass. God will bring justice. And there are those times where we feel like the whole world may stand against us, and we may feel like we're being wronged. We try to do the right thing. We try to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord, and sometimes what we find is that is met with mockery, with scorn, even with hatred, Sometimes there are divisions that come into our lives. We're separated from people that we love because we've taken a stand on God's word and all that comes at a cost and there are people who will do everything they can to apply that pressure to try to lead you away. But he says, no, when I rise up in the night, I praise you because of your righteous rules. Do we delight to praise God in the night, even in the face of our enemies? Do we rejoice in his righteous rule? The one transformed by the word of God rejoices in God's justice. We see in verse 63 that the one transformed by the word of God loves the people of God. He says there, I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. Now, we're not unfamiliar with that word companion. It speaks of a friend of a fellow, someone who has communion with you. The, the, the word literally talks about being knit together. I am, I am knit together with those who fear you. I was leading a Bible study last night. We're going through a study in Colossians with some friends, and we're, we're, we're speaking through that in Colossians chapter 2. It talks about those who are knit together in love. That's Paul's desire for this church. It's what he's seeking for them. But they're going to be knit together in love by understanding and having knowledge of the mystery of God, which is found in Jesus Christ. So these people who are united around the truth of God's word and united in God's gospel, he says, when that happens, you are being then knit together in love and your hearts are being encouraged. Now, similar language being used here, obviously in the Hebrew and not in the Greek, but there's a connection here to those who are knit together. He says, I am knit together with those who fear you. Those who know and serve the Lord, they find commonality. They find fellowship. They find companionship in their shared faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing that wherever you go, if you find yourself with the people of God, you can find yourself at home 
Isn't that something where, where you go meet total strangers and yet you learn that this person is a fellow pilgrim on this journey. We are seeking out the Lord together and you find that brother or that sister and you find that together you belong. Your souls have been knit together and you didn't even know it. And so he talks about being a companion to anyone who fears the Lord. If you've ever gone different places around the world or into different cultures, or even if you've just crossed your community and you've, you've met up with people that you never knew before, when you find that commonality in the gospel, it brings you together. And there's a strength in those relationships. We gather together around the truth of God's word. But I do want to throw this in there. He says, I'm a companion of all who fear you, those who truly honor and review the Lord, and those who keep your precepts. So I think that tells us that this is not something we ought to take lightly. He is a companion, yes, to all the people of God, but he specifies those who fear you and keep your precepts. Our love is something that we share without discrimination. It, it, it is to be offered to, to anyone and everyone. We don't, we don't try to qualify whether or not we're going to care for someone, whether we'd be willing to meet their needs. But our, our most intimate fellowship, I think that's something that ought to be guarded. Not that we don't befriend lost people, not that we don't love people who are struggling. Like, we're going to bring them in, and we're going to bring them into our homes, and we're going to sit them at our tables, and we're going to invite them into our living rooms, and we're going to love them and care for them. But our most intimate fellowship, we ought to be careful with that. We ought to protect that. Because I believe it's meant for those who truly share our faith. I guess I would just say that be careful who you surround yourself with day in and day out. Certainly be out there and developing friendships and meeting new people and loving people in the Lord and, and seeking to reach them with the good news of the gospel. I'm not trying to downplay any of that, but those closest relationships that you're going to share every moment of your life, those people that you're going to be knit together to, better be people who are on the same path that you're on. He talks about turning his feet into the pathways of the Lord. You want to, you want to know how very quickly your feet can be turned away from the pathways of the Lord? Make your most deepest, intimate connections with people who don't know and love the Lord. So I think there's, there's, there's caution in this. He is a companion to everyone who fears God, who keeps his precepts, but there's an expectation that they fear God and keep his precepts. He's not going to be intimate with the world. I think we should add to that there are a lot of people who will profess the faith vaguely on some level. But I think we can figure out pretty quickly where there's true kinship that unites us around the gospel and where there's something else. So I just want to say that just to be careful. We, the one who is transformed by the word of God loves the people of God. So we look for those who fear God, who keep his precepts, and we find ourselves knit together with them. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, glorious thing. But protect your fellowship. So the one who is transformed by the word of God loves the people of God. And the one who is transformed by the word of God rejoices in God's abiding love. Verse 64, the earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. He talks again about steadfast love. If you were here a couple of weeks ago when uh, Jeremy was teaching, he talked about that, getting into that uh, previous, uh, verse 41, about the steadfast love of the Lord that comes to us, that brings us salvation, that Greek word, uh, hesed. He, he said it almost right. You have to kind of choke on those at the beginning, so kind of, it's hesed, if you really want to get that right. But anyway, this merciful kindness of God that cannot fail, his steadfast love that rescues us and that redeems us. He, he says there in verse 41, that steadfast love from the Lord is God's salvation that comes to us according to his promise. And so what the psalmist is saying is that, look, everywhere I look, I see your faithfulness. I see this abiding love that's being poured out on your creation. Everywhere I look, I know you care for your own. He sees the steadfast love of God in his care for his people, in his provision for all of creation at all times, in all places, under all circumstances. Again, if we think, if, if this is David who's writing this psalm, it's very possible that it is. Think about David's life. We, we studied not that long ago, going through First and Second Samuel. We, we went through all of that, right? And so David desires to please the Lord, and everything is wonderful and just goes his way. No. He finds himself alienated. He has to flee. He's hiding out in caves. He's running from place to place, trying to escape the hands of his enemy who's coming to seek his life. But everywhere he goes, what does he find? 
God is still faithful. God is still blessing. God is still caring for him. God is still providing for his needs because God has a a purpose. God has a plan for him that he is going to carry through to its completion. And God has a promise for all of us. The one who began a good work in us, we know this, right? We're confident of this thing, that the one who began a good work in us will carry it through completion in the day of Christ. So if you think about this, if we're, we're talking about David writing this psalm and says, everywhere I go, I find your faithfulness, your steadfast love. The same is true for us. Everywhere we go, even when things don't seem to be everything we might desire for them to be, when things are hard, when things are, are confusing, when there is struggle, when there is difficulty, we still know that God is faithful. We see it all around us. The psalmist says, Lord, your, the earth is full of your steadfast love. He sees it everywhere. It brings him joy and it moves him to want to know more of it because what does he say? God, I see your faithfulness everywhere. The beauty of your gospel is is at work. Your, your, Your faithfulness is being poured out everywhere I go. So God, teach me. Teach me. Teach me your statutes. I want to know more of this. As you provide for all of your creation, continue to provide for me. Sustain my life day by day. He's building his life on the word of God. And he says, just continue to teach me your word. Do you rejoice in God's abiding love for you? Do you see his faithfulness around you? And do you desire to know him more because of it? This is a picture of the life of one who has been transformed by God's word. One who says in the beginning that the Lord is my portion my greatest treasure, my greatest joy, the one that I delight in. And because the Lord is my treasure, I have all that I need. And so I'm going to build my life around knowing and serving the Lord, obeying his word, doing his will, persevering under trial, doing all that needs to be done till the day when he takes me home. The one whose life is transformed by the word of God treasures the word of God, seeks the favor of God, keeps watch over their own life, is quick to obey the word of God, stands firm under persecution, rejoices in God's justice, loves the people of God, and rejoices in God's abiding love. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commands. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. This is the prayer of the psalmist as he seeks the Lord who is his portion. And I pray that it would be the prayer of our hearts as we seek the Lord who is our portion. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we delight in you. We proclaim that you are our portion. And God, I pray that you would help us to make you our portion, to make you our greatest treasure, our greatest joy, to delight in the gifts you offer us through your mercy and your salvation. And God, that our heart's desire would be nothing more than this, to know you more and to live for your glory as we keep your word. God, we thank you that your word has done its work among us, that your spirit has worked in concert with the word to help us see our sin, to see our need for mercy, and to receive the mercy that's ours through your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would help us to continue to live and to walk in that mercy in ways that are for our good, as you bless us and keep your promises for us and that are for your glory. As we live faithfully in obedience to your word, as we hold out a faithful testimony to the transforming power of the gospel, and as we long for your presence every moment while we wait for you to come. God, would you take these truths and work them into our own hearts. Transform us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.